listening to Flop Culture, a podcast where we talk about flops, pop culture, and the hot goss from the week that was. My name is Fanula. I will be your host for today's proceedings. Bit of a different episode this time around, so without further ado, let's get into it. At one point in time, Glossier, as a makeup brand, seemed untouchable, offering an aesthetic that was truly just blossoming on social media. The marketing was perfect, the quality of most of the products spoke for themselves. But then in 2020, something shifted for their customers in a massive way. Joining me to discuss is content creator Tara Marzuki, aka Tara Mar. Tara, I'm so delighted to have you on Flop Culture. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm honored to be here. Honestly, this is like my first podcast in a long time and definitely my first like professional one. And of course, massive fan of Nulo over here now. So uh, would you would you stop now too much? You're banding around the word professional there, which makes me nervous <laughs> <laughs> about your That's expectations for this podcast. But um, <laughs> we're going to have a good chat because I, I loved your pick. It's a bit off center in comparison to some of the others this season, but I think it absolutely fits. What did you pick for anyone listening? Initially, I picked Glossier Play, which was kind of their sister, big sister makeup brand, a bit bolder, a bit more vivid. But I think actually in general, Glossier has been kind of a bit of a flop all in all. It's kind of like on a downward spiral. So I think kind of the brand as a whole, in my eyes, is kind of becoming a bit of a flop, considering kind of, I don't know, a bit of a fall from grace, we'll say. For sure, for sure. What was your first interaction with the brand? When did you come to know it? Um, I think probably around the same time it came on everyone else's radar, but I was definitely in New York. I would say it was probably around 2016. They really just kind of like blew up on the scene. They were kind of doing something different with beauty and makeup. And I think... At the time, it was very much like Anastasia Beverly Hills era. So still very kind of like a lot of makeup artistry. There wasn't really a lot of emphasis on like no makeup, makeup. And at the time, I was very much in that zone. Like I wasn't experimenting like I used to. I kind of had been through that phase. And um, I don't know, it kind of was a makeup brand that really called me for like a number of reasons. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but like that pink was just everywhere. Like you couldn't open Instagram without kind of seeing something Glossier related. So I think I was quite intrigued by the brand. I think they were definitely the first kind of digitally led millennial direct consumer makeup, but just something different. I'd never kind of seen it before. Um, and they were very like community led, which I hadn't kind of seen. I think it was a kind of a brand where they really emphasize community. And I don't know, maybe like looking back, maybe it was a bit more of like a click in a way, but it was something that you kind of wanted to be part of it um so they kind of caught my eye for that reason and at the time I was in when I first moved to New York I was a product photographer so uh, I also was really intrigued about how they were using like social media and social media photography and like I don't know if you remember like top shelfies and flat lays were were all the rage so I think that kind of intrigued me but I think the biggest thing that drew me into the brand was the fact that I mean, it's kind of laughable now when you look back on it, but they were one of the more diverse brands at the time in like 2016. And um, I'd, like, if no one knows me, I know we're on a pod, it's all audio, but I'm half Asian. So I definitely grew up in Ireland, not kind of seeing myself represented in any sort of way. So I don't know at the time, like I think their main models, it was just like two people of color, one white person. And I just, I felt like, their community that they were building online was very mixed. It was kind of like there was a place for everyone and like every ethnicity, every race was kind of emphasized at the time. Like looking back, I'm probably like, it's probably wasn't that diverse, but in the where the way the market was at the time, I was just like, Oh, I've never seen this before. So I think that's what initially pulled me into the brand. It's so funny to hear that now. And I'm sure you definitely weren't the only person to consider them kind of diverse at that time when you did compare them to like, you know, the likes of the heritage brand. I don't I don't need to name names because people will yeah, know them. It's the ones you yeah. see on any like standard beauty counter anywhere. And then that whole thing of them being diverse and kind of ahead and disruptive was probably kind of one of the reasons they also ended up flopping in a way, because it did just become a thing where, as you said, 
they kind of positioned themselves as being different but it became a thing that it was like you're different because you're nearly exclusionary in a way wasn't it yes definitely I would agree like and as well it was kind of you know they still weren't including people that let's say had acne or other skin problems so it was diverse in the way that they were kind of like racially and like more um, on an ethnicity level diverse but it was still kind of like the girls were still very pretty I would say and like they were still selective um, and they still I think followed like a recipe for the kind of people that they emphasized on their page um but yeah I think it's like you said it was kind of at the time for me it was just I don't know maybe like taking whatever crumbs were going I don't know at the time it just felt like oh really big deal and I think maybe as well because they took kind of personal interest in me I know everyone's probably like why are you bashing a brand that you worked with I look here I still use one or two glossy brands it's not like um they're completely cancelled for me but I feel like they're definitely on the way out they're definitely a brand that I'm not like no longer excited about which I think is part of the flop they seem to have kind of just lost that excitement with their audience like no one's interested in what they're doing they're kind of not doing any new product launches and everyone's just kind of passing them out do you think that's as a result of the industry itself changing as well because as you mentioned Glossier was in that unique position of being really digitally led and very interesting in that way uh, Emily Vice, the founder you know it's kind of a, they started as a blog as far as I was aware into yeah. the gloss um, that was again kind of all the things you mentioned like very lifestyle beauty led um, and then she ended up going to got huge traffic there insane numbers um, and then she ended up going to investors being like I have something here let's do an e-commerce kind of a thing and then came out with the initial kind of capsule four products that we know most like the the balm the facial mist sheer skin tint moisturiser we now know the cloud paints and everything else that they've added to blah 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 but I suppose you say about the brand kind of not being as exciting anymore is that also because the industry has moved so far along because I remember even as someone who didn't really never who never really worked fully wasn't fully immersed in the industry was just like an enthusiast watching how the beauty industry has changed from like then to now and those early days of YouTube and like the way that changed how much do you think that factor impacted Glossier? Well I think out of all brands they should have been the ones to kind of make it work because initially they were really co-creating with their customer base I would say like they were really listening to what people wanted they were kind of really like ahead of the times in terms of like using social media and actually creating kind of more of a lifestyle brand to be honest I think Emily Weiss at some point said like none of the beauty brands that I like like if you put their name on a sweatshirt I wouldn't want to wear it And she really wanted to make a brand where like people, you know, and like she did that. She put glass air all over sweatshirts and people bought it and people bought the merch. And it was kind of became more of almost a lifestyle thing. And again, kind of like harking back to the kind of click. It was almost like kind of on borderline click um, energy. But I think that I don't know what happened along the way because they got so much funding. They, I think as well, they kind of approached the beauty industry as almost like a tech brand. Um, I think like half of their staff like worked in tech. They got so much funding. I think even up to last year, they got like 80 million in funding, but then like laid off 80 of their 200 employees, which is never kind of a good sign considering like the brand itself is only seven or eight years old, Mm. kind of get so much funding. I'd say well over like 150 million worth of funding and then to kind of just stagnate. I don't know. Like I, I think that they didn't need to kind of let other brands pass them out. It's just other brands are really doing amazing things with sustainability or better ingredients. And I think that's kind of where the the market is sort of shifting. Like they haven't kept up with that. I don't know if they haven't invested more money in creating new products or they're just like afraid to move forward. But I think now people are looking for more from their beauty. They're not just looking for 
great um, payoff or um, pigment. Oh my God, that word pigment is so triggering. I feel like that's like such a YouTube, like swatchy girl (laughs) (laughs) term. But I think people are looking for like better ingredients and better environmental factors. I think actually, I think Glossier really pissed people off at one point, especially with Glossier Play, which was like the louder version of their um, kind of sister, I guess it was like a sister makeup brand in a way, um, which I think was their biggest flop because I think it only ran for about two years and then they quietly kind of discontinued it. And the weird thing is, I think that brand would have done well now. Like I think that kind of minimal skin, loud eye, loud lip is doing really well now, but they should have launched it under a different brand name. Like they shouldn't have done it under Glossier um, because I think there was just too much of a disconnect for people. Like people just couldn't put the the no makeup makeup with whatever they were trying to do with Glossier Play. It just like didn't make sense to people. I think they should have like relaunched it or launched it under a different brand name completely. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, the way the market's kind of going people just like don't want that like excessive packaging they want to be more conscious they want to like know what's in their products and they're kind of willing to give their money to to other brands that are kind of doing that but it's kind of funny because now I go on TikTok and I kind of see them like desperately clawing at like paid sponsorships like I've seen about 20 Glossier fragrance ads like a day now on like TikTok and I'm like what is going on here I'm like what you're just paying everyone to talk about this part. Like no one's like organically talking about it anymore. I don't know. It just kind of feels like it's a bit of a sinking ship. That was the one thing that I found when I did order from them. Cause I act, I really like their brow products, but it was the, they give you the choice that it's like, do you want like the regular or regular schmegular you'll get and you'll get all the stickers and you get a nice envelope yeah. and it's so gorgeous. And here's 13 layers of tissue paper and also some plastic <laughs> and, and, it's all, <laughs> and it's pink and it's gorgeous. Oh, how could you not love it? Or you just tick this box and you don't get it. Like, I think that yeah. was, and I obviously didn't get all that other shite with it because I just wanted my eyebrow products. Yeah, but I think yeah, that yeah. was the biggest thing. And as you mentioned with Glossier Play, because they had these like, eye gels eye jellies jellies I think they were called and the whole thing was that you know like the glitter wasn't biodegradable they were wrapped in foil and then it was like in a separate box again like it was was just triple packaging yeah it was layer after layer after layer and as you say even Emily uh, Emily Weiss did come out and say I don't know why we didn't just I'm paraphrasing slightly but she was like I don't know why we released another sub brand when we should have just released the products even as under Glossier like it's yeah. because especially as you said we've definitely moved into this phase of whatever position the beauty industry is in we're in a really fun phase where like people are kind of being more experimental and it's not either you know like people aren't being either very like clean girl aesthetic I'm doing yeah, bunny ears because I hate that other, term yeah. yeah exactly there's a lot more room for experimentation and it's not just like you know you're either doing cut creases or you're not you know what I mean or you're yeah. doing, or lip balm and mascara you know it's that kind of fun playground but I just wonder at that point had they kind of lost the will of the audience and this audience who are aging out and looking at their products and being like why am I getting this stuff that comes with all this excess shit that I know is so harmful and everything else I don't know it's just such a strange execution from someone who had been making very smart business moves up until this point yeah and I wonder if it's like because like herself I suppose she is a millennial so I wonder like as the CEO obviously she's making a lot of these decisions but maybe she's also just susceptible to like just not knowing what people want to a degree but I find that hard to believe with like a gigantic team like they had like I actually went to their office one time ironically I was an ambassador for them at one point Um, we love it yeah Uh, it's so funny I know like how the tables have turned um but I just it's so crazy because at the time like everyone just wanted to be a part of what they were doing but somewhere along the way like maybe she also just doesn't like she's lost the brand vision I don't know but um a lot of people since have kind of just like employees um ex-retail workers I think that was also like part of the downfall is kind of like the boycott that sort of happened since with the brand I feel like that's another thing people don't want to support it's like they don't want to support brands where they like openly know that there's kind of like shady stuff going on or there's like ill treatment of employees going on. And there was like an Instagram 
page at one point I don't know if you heard of it it was called like out of the glass so it was very much a kind of like whistleblower like this is what it's really like working for Glossier they don't respect you they don't let you go to the bathroom on an eight-hour shift there is no bathroom apparently in some of the like stores Um, and like just so many employees just came forward saying like they just you know, were racially abused by customers. Their manager didn't do anything about it and they just weren't like treated well. And I think that that is something that's really important nowadays as well when it comes to having any kind of a brand is like you want to know that you're supporting a brand with like some kind of like moral compass or like a brand that like cares about the people working for them so that kind of feeds into again what people are looking for these days they're kind of looking for like a 360 feel good look good do good brand is there anything they can do to claw themselves out of this very long flop era I don't think so I think that they've like for the last year they've just been too quiet and I think that as well like with things that have happened in the past whether it be like the employee whistleblowers or like the packaging stuff I don't think they made like an honest enough like apology like I think they kind of did the bare minimum and I don't think it was kind of satisfactory for a lot of people um so I don't know if they can honestly I think that it's going to be a bit of a slow slink so so thinking slow sinking ship um like a lot of their stores haven't reopened I think that's a really big sign um I know a lot of them closed over COVID but like there isn't any store in New York now which is obviously like massive and um, to not have a store in New York I know they're still opening a few which is really like confusing but I don't know I don't think they can to be honest I just think there's too many brands I've gotten out in front of them that are doing like really cool things um, like what brands are you liking at the moment actually out of curiosity what do I like um, I the one that jumps to mind for me I suppose the one that kind of naturally seems to have taken this place is Rare Beauty oh Selena Gomez brand, yeah. right? with the like I just think with the aesthetic and the product types that's where yeah. I kind of see and even to be honest when I was researching it kind of seemed like that was the consensus among people, you know, the people who had moved on from like the cloud paint. So like Glossier's yeah. liquid blushes, they moved on to the the soft pinch, Selena's one with Rare Beauty. Um, yes. I haven't tried any of the newer bits from House Labs, but I'm really intrigued by them because I thought they were in a weird position and I feel like they've kind of picked settled down they've picked again. Up. Yeah. Yeah, they pivoted. For sure. What about you? What are the brands, when you mention those brands, who are you thinking of? Again, like when you were mentioned Rare Beauty, I think like, um, like uh, I think Glossier kind of paved the way for those kind of brands to do well. Like they kind of, what's the saying? Uh, Glossier walked so Rare Beauty could run. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm like notorious. Like my boyfriend always gives out to me, I'm notorious for butchering sayings. It's like my brain just, when it comes to like a saying, brain stops working. Like I'll always say it backwards or arseways. Um, it's kind of comical at this point. But I think again, like that's a p- perfect example. Like Rare Beauty has come through with like 48 foundation shades. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, th- I think that's another thing that like Glossier never did and kind of made their image of diversity kind of more surface level because when it came to the actual shade ranges, they never really expanded more than like 10, 12 shades. And then you have all of these other brands like Fenty coming out with just so much um, and just like, you know, coming out with like 50 different shades. And it's just, that's kind of the industry standard now is... Yeah to cater to as many people as possible and to not kind of paint people, I guess, the same 10 shades. But I would say for me, like what's really taken over in the place of kind of that glossier aesthetic or type of products for me is Korean beauty brands, like things like Say Beauty or even brands like Ilia. Like I think that they're kind of like holding the torch now for that no makeup makeup or even just like but still with room to play but I think that they're people are wanting like for example with Say Beauty I really love Say Beauty because it kind of feels like you're getting Korean skincare with your makeup like I just feel like it's giving more whereas Glossier never really emphasized their ingredients as much and I think that just kind of falls into what people are looking for people just want like better quality stuff or stuff that does more um 
than just makeup, you know, kind of like skincare, fusion. Fenty Beauty, I suppose, is the other obvious example because it was just like, I really feel like Glossier saw themselves as Fenty and they just, beyond the fact that they were just totally different brands, they just never were, they were never in the same lane. You know what I mean? And I know there's arguments against like, obviously, Rihanna had much more going for her in terms of like money, like cultural capital, everything like that. But she went and did the work in every single area and even answering that very basic question of why are we not catering to the darkest of skin tones when there's like a market there and they want something and blah, blah, blah. It's, yeah, it's just kind of, when you look at them and look at what they did and look at how even other, the other copycat like celeb brands or any, or not even, not even just celeb brands, but look how much they've tried to model themselves off like Fenty. It's just mad that Glossier, like the lack of self-awareness around that and around the shades and everything else, that it was just, you could have been that, but you weren't. And I just don't really know why. Yeah. Yeah. It's the lack of like self-awareness. I think when it comes, it's almost just like, they were like, well, we're going to do what we want and we're going to make you kind of think you're a part of it, but actually you're not. (laughs) Like I, like they really, they had all of the resources in the world to kind of see and hear what people wanted and see what other brands were doing. And even like, I know like makeup does go in cycles, kind of like any other trend. I think Fenty came in at a time where, okay, people were kind of getting sick of the no makeup makeup look and kind of wanted a bit more, like something a bit more bold, something a bit more like excessive. And Fenty kind of like swooped in and really provided that for people and kind of set a new industry standard, I think. And, but it'll be interesting to see whether they kind of like keep that up now and like what's going to be next. Yeah, that's the thing. I just find myself looking at all these brands and it's, I suppose, again, it's comparing to however old I was, like 14, 15 year old me, like inhaling all the YouTube content and like all the tutorials and all the products. Yeah. And like looking at all these new collections and being like, I have to have everything. And now seeing there's very few things that like genuinely, especially when it comes to makeup and beauty, there's very few things that like genuinely excite me or very few collections where I'm like, this is cool. You have done something different here it's just to compare the position the industry is in now to then is just it boggles my mind I think well now like there's just I think it's really the age of like the indie makeup brands like the brands that are really good at doing like one or two things like really specific products um and I know like makeup has such a great markup anyway it's such a good kind of industry to get into um, cause you can kind of make it like a really good return on it. But I just think that like at the moment, like I'm hearing of all of these obscure makeup brands I've never heard of, but I will literally go on two clicks later and I have like their glitter or their glow in the dark shit or like whatever. So it's kind of like at the moment, I just don't feel like you need to like have this like big, crazy funding or to be like associated with a big, like kind of, you know, umbrella brand to kind of get you launched. Um, I don't know, maybe Glossier kind of paved the way for that. Like in terms of like, I know they kind of weren't exactly like completely, like they did have startup funding, but I think now everyone kind of feels like they, they can do it. Like even if they only want to work on one brand, I feel like the likes of TikTok, you can kind of get product into people's hands. I feel like that's the way I'm shopping the most is seeing real people on on the likes of TikTok, like genuinely use something and genuinely recommend something. So interesting. So interesting. Even with the way TikTok has implemented like e-commerce and shopping itself, like that's revolutionized brands like made by Mitchell, uh, Mitchell's makeup brand. Uh, they make huge sales there. It's just, it fascinates me. I could honestly, I could talk about this all day. I'm obsessed. Uh, Tara, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Where can people find out more about you, follow you, look at your shit? Because you've got, you've got good shit out there, I have to say. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, Fanula, coming from you, that is a compliment. Thank you very much. Um, everyone can find me on, um, I've been burdened with the same username for many years. It's just Tarmers on everything, T-A-R-M-A-R-Z. Instagram, YouTube, if you want to hear me ramble on more. Um, and yeah, and TikTok apparently now. <laughs> <laughs> they always get us in the end. Uh, I leave all of uh, Tara's links in the show notes. Do you hate Tarmers now? I love Tarmers. 
I have like a love hate thing with it. Like right. it started off as like a, like a pseudonym. So like none of my extended family could find me on Facebook. Okay. Um, <laughs> genuinely. And just like, that was my Facebook name. It was just Tamara's back in like 2008, I would yeah. say. And now it's just stuck. Like even my mom calls me Tamara's sometimes <laughs> and it like, <laughs> I don't know how to feel about it. It's who you are. It's who you are. I love it. Don't be burdened. It's my brand. I it's love my it. Brand. It's your brand. Tamar, it's Tamar's your brand. Eyeshadow coming soon. <laughs> Tara, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on Flop Culture. You'll have to come back. We'll talk about something else for sure. Absolutely. Hopefully, catch you in a cork there over the Christmas. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> love it. Big thanks to Tara, aka Tarmar, for joining me. I'll leave all of her links below. We recorded this episode a while ago for timing reasons and it's funny because now I think Glossier might be coming out of their flap era, to be quite honest. Which is interesting as a case study because this is possibly the first thing we've covered on flap culture that is in transition from flop to bop again because it obviously was so ingrained in culture. If you were into makeup, if you were into that era, you were into it and it was kind of inescapable. Um, But obviously off the back of its kind of controversies, the brand spent much of 2022, I think, trying to regroup and make up for mistakes made and kind of recalibrate what the brand was. Uh, A third of its workforce were laid off at the start of last year. Emily Weiss stepped down in May. Kyle Leahy, who was formerly the company's chief commercial officer, stepped into the chief executive role. Uh, She oversaw this massive corporate restructuring. The business model changed. Uh, Initially, you could only buy Glossier on its website or in its official stores. But in July of last year, Glossier came into Sephora in the States. means nothing to us yet because we still don't have Sephora. Will we ever get Sephora? Probably not. Uh, But that was a big change for them. In terms of the launches, the launches have changed. So previously, they would have done like four launches a year. They're introducing a lot of new items as we speak. They're looking at every four to six weeks. You've got shade add-ons to cloud paint, one of their most popular products. And then you have entirely new products like deodorant. G Suite is a new opaque lipstick that they've literally just launched this month. Uh, Cleo Mack, who's the chief marketing officer, has said about this lipstick. This launch marks an exciting inflection point for Glossier makeup. Our makeup is credited with spearheading the light touch makeup movement, products that give a skincare like glow. Our real mission, the mission all along, is to develop products that work for you, not products that make you work for them. We're not about a singular look. We're about the best experiences, period. The experiences that let you define your personal beauty style for yourself. And I think we can all agree that those are all certainly words. They opened a flagship store in New York earlier this year, as well as brick and mortar stores in Chicago, Boston. As I already mentioned, it's in Sephora in the States. Uh, They reintroduced their BAM.com earlier this year as well with an updated vegan formula and new applicator tip. And according to them, they sold $1 million worth of the BAM in its first week, in its first week of return, which is a lot of BAMs, a lot of money. You cannot deny that. Another positive change, they're growing their grant program for black-owned beauty businesses beyond the US. This was rolled out in the US, but now it's coming to the UK. The grant program rolled out in the US in 2020 and has since partnered with more than 30 founders across 26 innovative brands. And to launch the UK version, they're partnering with Black Girl Fest, the UK's first arts and culture festival dedicated to black women, girls and non-binary people. It's a 12-week learning program, will support UK-based black women founders to take their business to the next level. Applications are open if you're listening and this sounds like a bit of you. They close on May 9th, 2023. And then five founders will be selected to take part in the program and they'll each receive £10,000 equity-free cash grant. Pretty good. Pretty good. What do you think? Do you think Glossier is still in its flop era? Are you a Glossier hater? Are you a Glossier lover? Would you love to see them open a store here? I think that's, again, one of my main bugbears with it is that I can't access it beyond online. And I know maybe that sounds insane in an age of convenience. All we want is everything online. But with makeup, obviously, very tactile, especially with some of these new launches, it would be great to be able to try them in person. But yeah, I kind of think they're back in the up. And while the argument could still be made that they've grown out of their original fan base, maybe there's an argument to say that they're actually growing with them and they can get their hooks into 
the Gen Zers and the Youngers that are coming up now, as well as still having their claws in our hearts, ye old millennials like me. It's interesting. Let me know what you think. Hello, flatculture at gmail.com. And we're at flatculture underscore pod across social media. Finally, strap yourselves in because we've got a very girthy top of the flop section this week. You're a flop. I was truly spoiled for choice this week when it came to top of the flops. A lot of people flopping, a lot of people flopping hard. Let's just get straight into our first one. And maybe I'm being too preemptive about this because there obviously is another weekend to come. Frank Ocean. He performed at Coachella the first weekend of Coachella, the music festival. He was headlining. He was closing the Sunday night, his first live gig in a very, very, very long time. I was not there, but some of the people who were there left less than impressed. So from the clips that I saw and from the reports that I've read, he didn't really perform. He performed a lot of alternate versions of songs that people know, uh, but they were very different uh, when he was not performing. He was kind of just moving around the stage, like lip syncing to pre-recorded tracks that he'd already done. Production was very, very scaled back and people were kind of left a bit head scratchy. He also came on an hour late and then ended up having to finish early because because he was late. Uh, it meant he went over curfew and he was only able to play for a certain time. And the main kind of overriding sentiment that I was seeing on social media was, there was one sentence that stood out to me. Someone said, I've never seen someone like deliberately sabotage their own set and like sabotage the experience for fans, which I thought was interesting. So a lot has come out since. So there were a couple of sources speaking to Variety saying that the performance had to be dramatically overhauled in the hours leading up to the set, which is why it might have felt weird. So there was a way more elaborate stage production uh, planned, which involved an ice rink with a group of skaters. This ice rink was constructed. They were going to skate around Frank and his band during the set. They had rehearsed for several days. They were ready to go. Apparently, Frank called it off Saturday afternoon, which is hours to go. And that left the only production really being him kind of sitting on a stool. If he wasn't sitting on the stool, he was kind of walking around at one point He was joined on stage by dancers wearing custom Prada, but it was still very, very, very low key. Um, And according to sources, Frank decided at the last minute that he no longer wanted it all. And when I say that, I mean the massive production. All the people walking around him at the start of the performance were actually ice skaters. Uh, They'd been practicing for weeks and were supposed to be skating as part of the production. Coachella had to deconstruct the approved stage that had been planned and signed off on for months in advance. They had to melt the entire ice rink and then set it up how Frank decided on the day, Sunday, with no warning, which is what fans ended up seeing and caused the hour-long delay. This all happened when doors had already opened for Sunday and people were securing their spots to see him. If the last-minute changes weren't made, he wouldn't have performed at all, leaving the festival without a closing headliner, which... I mean, maybe you could argue would have been worse. I'm, I feel like the majority would. I feel like I can argue against that and I will a bit later on. With regards to why he was sitting on the stool and stuff, these other reports came out, I think, in response to the criticism. Uh, apparently his performance had to be adjusted as well because he got an ankle injury during onset rehearsals in the week leading up to the festival. He was seated for a lot of his set, but at points he is walking around. You can see him during the DJ set, he's kind of up and he's bopping around the stage for a few minutes. Again, like we have no idea about his level of mobility or anything and I'm not, at no point am I going to throw around accusations, but it doesn't really, I'm not sure how that ties in with the original production being called off. Was he also going to skate? That's not what the initial report seems to suggest. It also doesn't really explain why if the injury took place earlier in the week, why the stage then had to be disassembled so quickly, like hours before it was actually supposed to happen. From a spectator's point of view, it's also hard to get like a good view on it because the views were so obscured. So the stage itself, you would like these massive video screens, right, that showed images from the stage. And But a lot of people said that they were like often unclear. At a lot of points, I think you couldn't see Frank because... He he had the performers like circling around him and the band as kind of like a half commitment to the original skating concept. 
But just the way the stage was set up then, basically it was not visible. It was not clearly visible to the majority of the people that were there. Then you have the issue with the live stream. So typically Coachella live sets are live streamed so that people who are not there can watch, right? A few hours before his set time, YouTube reveal would not be live streamed uh, as promised, which also left a lot of people feeling very disappointed. People who got up early, maybe who weren't based in the States, whatever. But that also kind of hints to me that maybe they knew it wasn't going to be the performance they wanted to give. From Coachella's perspective, I don't think they ever would have pulled the live stream other than they knew it wasn't going to be the show that he was going to deliver. I don't think anyone could have anticipated how like crazy, and when I say crazy, I mean like not great it was going to be, but maybe that was Coachella trying to distance themselves from this. Was it Frank knowing that he was never going to be able to commit to the show that he had maybe promised? We don't know. Uh, as I mentioned, he came on around, uh, he was an hour late and then ended up ending his set at around 25 past 12 Pacific t- Pacific time, a.m., whatever you want to say. Uh, Coachella's curfew is generally, I think it's at 1 a.m. for the Friday and the Saturday and then it's midnight on Sunday. So he was already 25 minutes over. So it ended up being quite a short set. Some people are speculating that it's something to do with his brother he is grieving the loss of his brother Ryan Bro he died in 2020 they used to attend the festival together uh, and he spoke about him on stage in a very nice tribute and address he said I know he would have been so excited to be here with all of us I wanted to say thank you for the support and the ears and the love for all this time and as I mentioned with Coachella the headliners they play the two weekends the second weekend nobody really cares what it's like whatever because the first weekend has already happened and it's much more muchness he is still scheduled to close out the second weekend uh, on April 23rd. Here's my thing, right? I've seen Frank Ocean. I saw him in 2013. He supported the Killers at Phoenix Park in what was honestly one of the strangest, like, it was a good gig, but the Killers were headlining and then it was Frank Ocean, two-door cinema club were second sport and then Haim were third sport, but they weren't like huge over here. And I remember actively at the time being like, who's Haim? And now I'm really embarrassed because I really like them. At that gig, I cannot remember he was late, but he did do, he didn't do a full length version of Pyramids, which was disappointing. He restarted Lost because he wasn't happy about it. And while he did sound absolutely no perfect, I could tell, and anyone in the audience could tell, he was hating every fucking second being on that stage. I don't think he likes performing live. And I think that's fine. As far as I'm concerned, as a fan, he's done enough for his entire life for, for me for him to never have to perform another millisecond ever, ever again. Those albums will be enough for me. Maybe that's easy easy for me to say because I've seen him. I don't know. I'm fine. Whatever. You'd want to perform live? Cool. How much did he get paid for this absolutely shambolic effort? Like at the very least in the millions. The weekend got $8.5 million the previous year and that was to replace Kanye. So you would imagine his original offer if it was just him and if he'd been offered it from the start probably would have been much lower at the time. I'd say you'd probably get that now because of whatever. But this is just to say that I would imagine Frank Ocean, the mystery around him, beloved artist, a great guest because he doesn't usually perform live. You'd imagine he got minimum, absolute minimum, $5 million. I think this is about money, not wanting to renege on a contract because he wanted to make the money. And I know... I really hope I'm not coming across hard here because I know there's a conversation to have around grief. His brother only died three years ago. This is a festival that they used to attend together. Maybe this all, maybe it all got too much, but there are just too too many factors even beyond that that I'm like, I don't know. And I suppose there's another argument to be made where I feel like the conversation around musicians is wholly more positive right now in terms of like cancelling gigs and prioritising mental health and stuff like that. And as much as I think people would have been disappointed and Coachella would have been mad if he cancelled last minute, I honestly think it was worse to go out and do this concert if he felt he wasn't up for it, as opposed to saying, guys, you know what? I've gotten here. I've put in a lot of work. I know people have travelled far away. I know people have spent a lot of money. I'm really, really sorry. I cannot do this. And I know I cannot do this to the best of my ability. It's not going to look the way I want it to look. I'm not going to sound the way I want it to sound. 
That's just my opinion. I just, I, I, you can't tell me a man who sells like $25,000 cock rings on the side. You can't tell me that this wasn't about money in some way. And I think the, the thing about the ankle injury. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. The thing about some things, the math's not math thing with, with some of these. And to be honest, I think he would have gotten away with one of these things being off. Like he is regularly late for gigs as far as I'm aware, he wasn't late for that killer's gig, but I've heard from other people and colloquially, like he he does not like coming on time. He hates timekeeping. He would have gotten away with maybe that. He would have gotten away with maybe limited production. It's everything else. It's it's not good. And it's very disappointing. And I hate I hate to call it flat behavior, but it is. And I think people are bending over backwards to defend him. And I don't really I don't really get that either as much as I would argue that obviously artists don't really owe us anything. I think there's a thing of, I don't expect the world from artists. I acknowledge that they are human and I acknowledge that even though it's a job with an insane amount of perks, it's still, I would imagine, because I cannot relate, but I would imagine it's unspeakably hard. At the same time, it's fans that put people there and I do think there needs to be a bare minimum level of respect and I don't know if this set got anywhere near that, if I'm being completely honest. But as always, just my opinion. Also taking the top spot for top of the flops this week, sitting sitting with Frank on a on the top of the pyramid, no pun intended, Vanessa Lachey as the host of Love is Blind. We had our season four reunion uh, this week, started this week, ended last week. Uh, the reunion also started out as a flop. It was Netflix's first ever live reality reunion. Didn't even end up happening live because of technical issues. They filmed it and put it out as live and it was a mess. And so disappointing for what was a good season, in my opinion. I th- I thought Vanessa and Nick were grand in past seasons. I actually don't really have a strong opinion about Nick. He said some like, qu- questionable makes it sound like he said like problematic things, but he's just, he's had these off the cup remarks and I'm like, all right, that was a bit unnecessary, whatever. I don't know how much he brings to it other than like the nostalgia factor and it's a name. I've generally found Vanessa quite good in these past reunions. I feel like she gets stuck in uh, and I feel like she's been a lot more direct than I've seen other people posting reunions be, to be completely honest. You get to this season and this reunion and she is directing all of her ire at very selective people and the wrong people if you are kind of, if you've watched this season at all, I suppose. Uh, Marshall and Paul were her main targets. Marshall never made it to the altar. He split with Jackie before they got there. Jackie began a relationship with someone else she met in the pods. Josh, I don't care about his name, but anyway. They ended up getting together. Her behaviour leading up to it was like, I don't know, just watch it. If you haven't watched it, then, and if you've watched, you know. She was just... It was a lot. I think there's an argument to be made that Marshall like shouldn't have walked away when they had a first fight, whatever. But there's a part of me that also doesn't think she was ever in it. And maybe they both didn't treat each other great, but she definitely treated him worse. And then you have Paul. So Paul got to the altar with Micah, who he met in the pods. But ultimately he said no. He didn't think they were ready. I got the impression that he still maybe wanted to stay together, was up for continuing a relationship just didn't think they were ready for marriage which I think ultimately was correct if you again watched their journey in inverse commas hate that expression but whatever uh she was mad at them lots of lots of angry questions lots of you know lots of questioning that just seemed very I don't know if you've watched a lot of Micah's behavior at the start of the series was pretty deplorable when it came to like other girls other guys the tone Vanessa's tone was a bit strange and didn't seem to speak to what people and what fans actually felt and then there was also a lot of talk around babies to the point where it kind of felt intrusive now I will say she always asked that she asks that every reunion I feel like she's contractually obliged to ask by Netflix because they want to legitimize what they're doing if they can get a baby out of this it's like bingo we we have it here. There's an advertisement to be like, you know, this is what this show makes families. You know what I mean? At this point, it's not enough for people to just be married, right? Like they are waiting for Lauren and Cameron from season one. To, they are waiting for her to get pregnant. And they she will be put, she will be everywhere. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. 
Um, now there is, there has been an update since. So Paul did get, uh, he got this bouquet of flowers, right? He posted on his Instagram stories with a caption reading, thanks for acknowledging the accidental misleading and then tagged Vanessa Lachey. I'm going to be honest, I don't know if that sentence makes sense or the English, but he wrote it, so don't come for me, right? Uh, so people were like, okay, she apologised, whatever. There's a part of me that thinks I don't actually think it matters after the fact then. I think it's too late because the damage is already done and the people aren't on, the people who watch Netflix maybe it doesn't necessarily translate that they follow Paul. You know what I mean? So they're never going to know that. There's a large majority that won't know that. But then he did an interview with People in which he revealed that it was like Netflix and their production team sent the flowers. Vanessa didn't send them. Now, she did separately reach out. He said, Vanessa sent me a message acknowledging that she may have been misled about how you wanted to defend yourself. I think it was supposed to be sort of an apology for the clear bias. At least that's the way I took it. So it's not really an apology then, though, I would say, is it? It's not. But anyway, people are mad. People are really mad. Someone started a petition on change.org. They want them to get the boot. They want Nick and Vanessa to be gone. The intro to the petition reads, from the initial season, the hosts felt pretty useless and out of place. They seem to be much more concerned with directing as much attention at themselves and their personal lives rather than focusing on the contestants that are actually participating in the experiment. Many enjoy the show, but it's being held back from its full potential with cringy Nick and Vanessa Lachey. Oh, And at the time of this recording, it's reached 18,000 signatures, I should say. I don't know if it'll actually do anything. I'm 90% sure they're locked into the next few things. I'm pretty sure they're hosting the queer ultimatum that's coming up on Netflix soon, which is where you basically bring your fiancé to be filmed and be like, propose to me or I'm shagging someone else and you're going to have to deal with it. Pretty sure they're hosting that. I don't know how they'd get out of contracts for other things if they're signed on to other things. Uh, Shane Jansen who was on season 2 also came out and defended them he was doing a QA and a today and he was basically saying because I think there's been some suggestions from what I've seen that like Lauren and Nick should take over or should be like a past couple from past seasons right and he he didn't seem to be in agreement with that I'm paraphrasing that now but he seemed to he tagged himself he tagged Andy Cohen and he tagged Shake from that season absolutely not no to Shake sorry about that, just cannot deal with that, as like potential replacements, I think. Um, But in terms of Nick and Vanessa, someone asked, is Vanessa always like that? The reunion was embarrassing for her, in my opinion. Uh, Shane said, lots of talk about these two. They were the nicest humans during my experience. My mom loved Vanessa and Nick shot the shit with us talking football, etc. They were extremely nice. So there you go. There you go. And look, I've seen this going around on TikTok as well where people have been like, the live was delayed because they were trying to sober up Vanessa. And I don't know if I want to get into that because I just feel like it's not fair to speculate on things like that. But I don't know, doing it live was always a mistake. As much as I talked, I've literally a few episodes back about how this is exciting and potential, blah, blah, blah. Like this just clearly didn't work. And you'd wonder if the reason why I thought she was good on previous reunions was because they were able to edit around her and take out the chaff and keep what was like decent. Whereas with this, you were seeing pretty, as much, as mu- even though it wasn't actually live, at that point, I'd say they were just like, hit record, we'll do, we'll do the best of what we can. You know, like, was it stress? Did she just go mad? Did the lights just get to her? I don't know. All I'll say is, I'm free and I'm cheap and I'm not a flop, but Vanessa Lachey is. Sorry. Thank you so much for listening. As always, if you could please rate the show five stars on Apple Podcasts, I would really appreciate this. And you can also leave a five-star review on Spotify if you are listening there. This podcast has been edited by Adam Shanahan, artwork as always by Brian Lambert. Until next time, see ya. See ya.